Hi, well, th thank you very much for um, the invitation to speak here tonight. I shall probably be somewhat uh, uh, briefer than David and, and, and outline the concerns that uh, the NGO community and Greenpeace in particular have uh, in relation to geo management. I mean, we're posing the question here I think is geo management or geo engineering, to give it another term, a defensible response to climate change? Greenpeace and climate change, a little bit of an introduction here. Greenpeace was one of the first NGOs to campaign on climate change as an issue, and I remember when we picked up uh, the, 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 the issue um, back in the late 1980s. And since then, the organization has worked very, very hard to uh, raise awareness, uh, to gain acceptance of uh, climate change as a real phenomenon, uh, to communicate the urgency of climate change, and indeed to identify some of the solutions. And on the, uh, the, 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 the graphic there, you can see uh, the uh, cover of the Energy Revolution, which is a series of reports which provide a, a working blueprint for how energy systems could uh, evolve in the real world in order to uh, reduce our dependence upon uh, carbon-based forms of uh, energy uh, generation. I mean, it must be said that uh, raising awareness, um, we were faced with a great deal of skepticism at the time. Um, many of the things that uh, we proposed as an organization um, as likely possibilities uh, in, 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 the, in the late 80s, early 90s, were almost derided um, by many people. Um, it's only in recent years that the IPCC, if you like, has uh, kind of caught up <laughs> and acknowledged that uh, indeed there are problems, they are urgent problems, and that there is a need to identify solutions, and indeed that climate change is actually a real phenomenon. So the evolution of the climate change debate then, well, ignorance, climate change, question mark, and there are still uh, a number of people that, um, you know, really don't understand it uh, and indeed don't believe it's, it, it's happening. Then there's a denial of the fact that it's happening. Um, you know, an acceptance perhaps that something is uh, going on that we ought to get a handle on, but there's actually uh, plenty of time. Uh, the phase that we appear to be in and perhaps leaving now, the urgency, we need to act now. Panic, it's all too late, so anything goes, which is the uh, point that we may be entering. Um, and certainly in the scientific community, there are increasing numbers of scientists that are very, very concerned uh, about the way that the whole phenomenon is unfolding and the speed at which it's unfolding. And then we have geoengineering. And the perception, I think, with, with, with many people is that geoengineering is one of these, um, these, these panic responses, these desperate measures. And that may have some justification. Um, it may be that it's a, an entirely unfair perception. What is geoengineering? Important to answer that question because uh, so it means different things to different people. But if we look at it as an intentional, large-scale manipulation of the environment by humans in order to bring about environmental change, particularly to counteract the undesired side effects of other huge human activities, um, that would be uh, about right. So then in the uh, in the context of, 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 of a climate change issue, it's ways of manipulating uh, the carbon cycle or um, ways of manipulating physical uh, parameters. And they've been around for a long time, as David made uh, very, very clear. I mean, this is a graphic from a report that um, was produced, uh, I think, in the early 90s, which we've been uh, using um, for, for a long period of time now, and uh, I think it encapsulates most of the uh, most of the the, the, the issues that we're we're, we're looking at. Um, if we look up in the uh, top left-hand corner, corner, we've got the giant reflectors in orbit uh, and aerosols in the stratosphere. These seem to be uh, hot favourites uh, of the moment. Um, add chemicals to save ozone, though um, why that might be relevant in this context is not ent entirely clear. We have uh, CO2 storage in Antarctic ice, the idea that you could take CO2 from a power station, turn it into blocks of dry ice, tow it down to the Antarctic, and it would both uh, be preserved by the Antarctic temperatures 
and, um, uh, and, and, and also help maintain them. Iron fertilization, the idea that you can add iron to the world's oceans and generate uh, a, a carbon drawdown from the atmosphere, uh, similar to the sort of seaweed cultivation idea and fertilizers that are being uh, put in for, for fish and even genetically engineered algae. I mean, many of these geoengineering proposals do um, draw on a lot of different uh, scientific disciplines. The idea that then that you could um, uh, grow lakes of algae, grow large quantities of trees, seed clouds, um, green the deserts, um, and then we have the various uh, engineering uh, solutions involving capturing carbon dioxide from power stations, shallow two CO2 injection into the world's oceans, uh, or pump liquid CO2 into the deep sea and leave it there on the bottom for long periods of time, or you know, the, the, the more favored of the, all of these uh, big options to pump liquid CO2 into rocks. And I suppose an acknowledgement that you know, if all of this fails, we're gonna need something to, um, uh, to, to, to look forward to. So of course, you know, proposals to terraform Mars have also been um, actually quite seriously seriously proposed. So that really sort of encapsulates what we would understand um, as a, a reasonably complete list of, of, of geoengineering uh, proposals in relation to climate. And uh, here's some of the more modern uh, graphics here. This uh, represents it. Oops, sorry. This, uh, this, this graphic here um, shows uh, the solar proposals for injecting aerosols into the atmosphere, uh, reflectors and, um, and, and aerosols. And here we have uh, a, an algal bloom um, due to iron fertilization um, in, in the ocean, one of a number of experiments that have been carried out in, in recent years. The last one um, failed to provide any really convincing evidence that we were going to get a significant impact on, 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 on carbon drawdown. Geoengineering has some key assumptions attached to it, which um, need to be made, I think, explicit. Um, the one, uh, the, 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 the key assumptions are that manipulating planetary systems is technically feasible, um, that it will result in predictable and positive impacts, uh, is reversible if it becomes necessary to reverse them, and is desirable or may become necessary, or indeed already is necessary. Um, these are uh, assumptions that I think need to be uh, really quite comprehensively questioned uh, before we embark on any geoengineering activities. And there's a corollary to this in terms of the assumptions that action to reduce emissions has failed so far and will continue to fail. There are some key drivers as well that I think we need to understand. Uh, the sort of desperation driver, or it's all too late to do anything else. We've got to consider um, all of these options, uh, whether they're desirable or not, and irrespective of the degree to which they manipulate uh, natural systems uh, even further than we've chosen to manipulate them thus far. Aspiration, it might just work, which is, of course, a very, um, a, a, a very real, um, real, real set of uh, drivers. Fascination. Wouldn't it be amazing if it worked? And uh, you hear that um, particular, uh, particular statement quite often. Wouldn't it be amazing if it worked? Yes, it, indeed it would. Um, the, the, un the, the problem is that we just really don't understand the downsides in any, in, any, any great, with any great degree of accuracy. And delegation. Uh, wouldn't it be amazing if someone else could fix the climate and thus reduce our personal and collective responsibilities to you know, a relatively simple set of solutions? And money, of course, is a big driver. It looks cheap, and we might even make a bit of money on the side. This was a, um, a, a theme that emerged from the uh, iron fertilization experiments that were conducted by uh, or were proposed by commercial concerns, you know, whose um, the, the company's motto was um, saving the planet and making a bit of money on the side. And I, I think we need to be uh, really quite careful uh, about the uh, financial aspects of this. Um, we need, need to be absolutely certain that uh, we keep um, commercial uh, activities uh, in, designed to exploit um, various international mechanisms uh, in, in very clear view. So some key questions that need to be answered. Can we and should we try to engineer ecosystems to our benefit? I mean, we could argue that most of the uh, attempts that we've made to engineer ecosystems to our benefit um, have been really quite damaging to planetary systems. Are ecosystems even amenable to predicted and um, predictable in engineered change? Will research reduce uncertainties to acceptable stroke negligible levels? 
and can we even measure and verify the true impacts, be they positive or negative? And I think there are some serious um, concerns attached to our ability to answer these uh, uh, questions in a, in, 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 in a in, in an holistic way. So geoengineering, is it simply a matter of balancing the risk? Climate change on the one hand and the risks of geoengineering uh, on the other. We have uncertainty attached to both climate change and geoengineering. We have indeterminacy, a sort of a subgroup of uncertainty that, that, that really um, identifies those areas which we're not really going to be able to get much more of a handle on uh, through research and, 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 and similar activities. And then we have the ignorance, uh, the, the things that we simply don't understand, um, and the things that we are unlikely to understand until they come out of the woodwork at us. And where these fall on the scales is really an open question. Turning down the global thermostat, is that a possibility? Well, there is no simple thermostat. I think we need to uh, realize and realize very clearly. Impacts of any geoengineering uh, proposals will not be uniform and could indeed, under certain circumstances, pro pro provide an excuse for uh, conflict. There will be winners and losers if we put these programs into place, and it would be a shame if the only winners um, fell with the same sort of global um, power balances that currently uh, e exist. And decisions and their impacts may actually be irreversible, and we need to be very clear about that, um, that if we made a decision go down a certain route and we pursue it, and we may not be able to um, reverse it in the longer term. And who is going to decide uh, the, where, where, what the cost benefits, uh, or the benefits and disbenefits, who, who's going to decide whether these are appropriate or not? For example, a single country could deploy a geoengineering systems from its own territory without consulting the rest of the planet. Um, quite, quite, quite possibly true, and that could have impacts uh, downstream. Who is going to mediate in the case that uh, someone, for example, seeds clouds, produces rainfall over their territory, and denies uh, precipitation to a country down, down current, so to speak? And because the option exists, it would be dangerous for scientists and policymakers to ignore it. That is also true, and I think a very, uh, a, a very strong theme that we can take from uh, Professor Keith's uh, presentation also. So Greenpeace's perspectives on this. Well, Greenpeace does not support research into geoengineering, not least because it is, it is a distraction from the real solutions as we see it. Uh, Greenpeace is sceptical of any research involving large-scale manipulation of natural systems, whatever its purpose. I think um, we take uh, that position from the fact that all of the attempts that we've done had made, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, to manipulate uh, natural systems have, have tended to end in tears. And any proposed research must, at the very least, be scientifically justified, carefully and consistently assessed and regulated with precaution. Now, when we say we do not support research, that doesn't mean we're actually um, obviously opposed to legitimate scientific research. This is not an anti-science stance. Uh, I think we're just taking this from the perspective that it, it, it really could become a very big distraction from what we perceive to be the real uh, solutions. So if there's a case for continued research, is the research truly in society's interest? Big question to our, uh, answer. Are there commercial interests in any particular outcome? Are there research initiatives which would better serve society's needs to address climate change now and in the future? And could geoengineering ever be a sustainable response to climate change? And sustainability is something that we don't talk about much in this context, and maybe we ought to be talking about it a little bit more. There's a challenge for science uh, implied in all of this. How can legitimate scientific research be allowed without opening up the global commons for ecosystem manipulation on a massive scale? I think that's a central question. Key roles for international regulate, regulatory oversight, the regulatory uh, regime uh, that applies uh, to most of these proposals is relatively non-existent. There needs to be consistent approaches from all the governments that are involved. And up, application of utmost caution, i.e. precaution, needs to be um, a, a given. For example, um, ocean fertilization under the London Convention, 1972, which uh, the convention was established to regulate ocean disposal of waste from vessels, and it promotes effective control of all sources of pollution of the marine environment. In particular, prevents pollution of the sea by the dumping of waste and other matter. And it announced its intention to regulate ocean fertilization in November 2007. 
This, uh, under the convention, the uh, convention allows for legitimate scientific research, but scientific research proposals should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis using an assessment framework. And given the present state of knowledge, ocean fertilization activities other than legitimate scientific research should not be allowed. So this is one of the few examples of a global regulatory framework that applies to a geoengineering concept. So Greenpeace's perspectives on legitimate scientific research. There needs to be justification, there needs to be consultation and consent, assessment, precautionary regulation, transparency, transparency liability and redress, and non-commerciality. And there's a moral choice involved here. On the one hand, action which can be taken now by government, business and society to address the causes of climate change at source, using established technologies in ways which aim to minimize changes to ecosystems on land, at sea, on land and at sea, and establish a more sustainable basis for development for future generations, which assign specific responsibilities for, to polluters, are independently verifiable and quantifiable, amenable to rapid adaptive management and control, and have a high technological chance of success or action which could be taken sometime in the future by a small subset of business to try and address climate change through engineering the capacity of ecosystems to assimilate pollution in ways which aim to bring about significant changes to ecosystems without addressing the unsustainability of current development models while shifting responsibility away from polluters and using methods which are not amenable to independent verification nor effective intervention to reverse unforeseen collateral damage and which have at best an unknown chance of success. I think the choice is ours, and we are very much at this crossroads between these two sets of, 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 of essentially quite different choices. Thank you very much. <laughs>